You know, faith and emotion are two different things, aren't they? You can have faith and not be feeling one thing. You just got a settled confidence. The Lord will work. That's all God needs to work. Now, sometimes you just feel your faith. And you feel strong. You feel good about it. You want to yell out loud or clap or dance or run. You know, that's sometimes. Sometimes that's the way it is. But not all the time. I'm just glad to have some faith in this building today. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Glad to see all of you here, all you faithful people. Call this your church. You rarely ever miss, except for extenuating circumstances. I'd hate to know what we would try to do without you. We couldn't make it. You're the church. You will. You are what make Living Way special. All the guests who are here today, man, you showing up, gracing us with your presence makes us feel special. Thank you all for being in the house of the Lord. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. I'm tonight, Brother Robin Johnson will be preaching. It'll be 6 o'clock tonight when that service starts. It'll be his last service with us for a little while, but um, we feel like God's going to do some good stuff things around here tonight, 6 o'clock. Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Somebody say in Jesus' name. Hey, before you're seated, speak to somebody and then you can be seated. I want to thank all of you who prayed for me. I was out of town speaking over the week, and your prayers were the driving force between things going for things going good, and I appreciate all your prayers. You're exceptional people. I wouldn't want to imagine my life without you. In my lifetime, I've driven all manner of vehicles. Good ones. Bad ones, and everything in between. In most of them, it was imperative for me that I keep my eyes on the gauges. Why? Well, it was simple survival. Because I knew that any minute something catastrophic could go wrong and leave me stranded. From time to time, I talk to people who've had car trouble, and I say to them, did the light ever come on? And they say to me, what light? And I think, you haven't driven the cars I've driven. I've even talked to people about their car, and I said, did you ever smell anything? Smell? What do you mean? I thought, oh. You've never had a car that ran hot or one that dripped oil feverishly. 
or breaks that could smoke at any notice. Because if you've had those kind of vehicles, you just drive cars differently. I, I drive today a nice car along the way, and, and I go down the road. I am listening. I am feeling. I am smelling. I am watching every gauge at every minute. And people make fun of me, sometimes my children, but I'm saying, hey, hey, I've been here before. And I've been on the side of the road. you got to be able to smell that thing right before it runs hot just to know what to do. The Scripture said that we read today, it said, know thyself. Now, that simple little phrase has been attributed to at least 11 different Greek scholars, notably Socrates. But, but the Apostle Paul wrote it in the Word of God in the modern English version, and he said it like this, keep watch over yourself. He makes it clear that there is a real responsibility that everybody in this building has as it relates to your walk with God. And while people are overseers over your life, at the end of the day, the ultimate responsibility comes down to this. Have you been keeping watch over yourself? And the Bible's clear that there is a war that goes on between the flesh and the spirit. And if you know that there's a war that's breaking out in your man, spirit man every moment of the day, it becomes essential that you watch out over some indicators of your spiritual condition. I, I want to talk about a few of those in the next 10 minutes real quickly. There's some indicators you have to watch out for. And the first thing you have to watch for is how is my appetite for God. How's my appetite? I want to love the Bible. I want to love prayer. I want to love corporate worship. And I want those things to be sure to be fresh and intimate and exciting in my life. And as soon as as any of those things start becoming dull in my life. There's an indicator going on in my spirit, man, that says these kind of things need attention. Just as soon as church isn't nearly as exciting for you as it used to be. Just as soon as prayer doesn't move you like it one time did. Just as soon as the idea of corporate worship begins to fade into your list of priorities, you better make sure that there's a warning indicator going off in, your, in the cabin of your spiritual life saying, hey, there's a problem somewhere. And my recommendation is this. As soon as church gets dull, as soon as prayer gets dull, as soon as worship gets dull, I'm going to shut everything down until I revive my personal excitement in the godly things. It's worth shutting everything down. It's worth stopping working overtime over. It's worth laying down some hobbies for your children. It's worth changing the whole pattern of your life until you can get some excitement built up in your spirit, man, about the things of God. Nothing means more than your spiritual appetite for God. And if it starts waning, you've got trouble going on in your life. Now, because we're humans, we'll try to justify everything. We'll try to first blame it on the church services. They're not as exciting as they used to be. Go tell that to somebody else. Worship isn't nearly about as driven as it used to be. You're talking to the wrong person. What you got to do at some point in your life is look in the mirror and say, I'm not as spiritually driven as I used to be, and something needs to change. Right before a catastrophe, you better learn to shut it down and get it right. I learned this the hard way as it relates to vehicles. I, I had a brother-in-law who had a little money. And, uh, and he just bought random things to have fun. He bought a random Corvette one day. It was a Corvette. It's black. It had T-tops. Um, but because he was connected to our family, everything we buy in the vehicle world usually have some problem. 
Like, it may look good on the outside, but it's probably got some sort of electrical short or it burns a lot of oil or something. Because, And our whole deal is if we can get it for a good deal, there's always optimism that we can fix it. So my brother-in-law had been around us a long time, and so he bought a Corvette. And it was shiny, and it was black, and it was nice. And it used lots of oil. And he said to me, uh, Glenn, you can drive this to school anytime you want. But you better make sure that you check the oil before you roll out of here. Because if you don't, you're in for trouble. But one morning I decided on the spur of the moment to drive the Corvette to school. And if you like cars like I like cars, you don't get in a Corvette and obey the speed limit every minute. You got to get it out of your system where you can settle down later. So I fire this thing up, and I mean, I roll out of the driveway. I got my foot in it. I'm flying. Life is good. There's an S curve not far from my school, and I'm thinking I'm a mile away. I wonder how fast I can take this curve without having to touch the brakes. Evidently, I wasn't going fast enough, so I put my foot in it some more. But right before I got to the S curve, I heard a strange noise. And every indicator in me, I was raised by a mechanic, every indicator in me said, turn it off now. But I was just about to go through that S curve. So I just put my foot in it some more. And right in the middle of the S curve, everything went dark. I burned the car up right in the S curve. My brother-in-law was a patient soul. I mean, what do you say? He said, we'll fix it. But there was an indicator right before it went bad. I'm telling you, your spirit, man, you're born with some spiritual indicators when you come into God's world, and you've got to be sure that you monitor him on every level. The second thing you've got to be careful about is what you have your eyes on. You've got to be careful what you're looking at. David was, was an anointed man of God, but, but he got his eyes on the wrong things. He learned it from his predecessor. Saul was anointed, but Saul got his eyes on David. And as soon as you get your eyes on the wrong thing, whether it's of the flesh or whether it's because you're jealous of somebody else, you're on your way to a spiritual catastrophe. You have to monitor your ideas about success. Here's what you do with success. Celebrate everybody else's, but be suspicious of your own. Celebrate everybody else's, but be suspicious of your own. Because success brings pride, and pride brings complacency, and nothing fails like success. At some point in your walk with God, if you win some really, really big battles and you come out on the other side and you walk into some really, really big prosperity, you better make sure that the next moment of your walk with God, you don't get complacent. Because as soon as you win an enormous battle, your flesh will tell you, you got everything under control. You might as well settle down. And I watch people break addictions and come through dark moments of grief and then get promoted and have great provision come in their life. And immediately I begin to watch them settle down. They don't pray like they need to. They don't worship like they used to. They're not nearly as faithful to the house of God as they once were. And I'm screaming all the time in my own walk with God, hey, guys, wake up. Because nothing brings complacency like victory. Another thing you got to pay attention to is your fear about anything. Paul wrote in Acts 20, none of these things move me. We live in a world possessed by fear, and as a child of God, you don't need to be afraid. 
I don't want a health scare or an aging scare or a nuclear scare or a terrorism scare or any other scare in my life to knock me off of my feet. I might be good to be concerned, but I'm not going to live my life every day of my life afraid of what may happen negatively around the next corner. i got a couple more here real quickly. you got to be concerned about your finances. You say, my Lord, Pastor, you've been spiritual all along, and now you're getting into money. we all messed up now. No, no. In our world of Quick credit and instant gratification. The temptation is to purchase things you can't afford to impress people you don't even know. And nothing will bog your spiritual life quite down quite like being so overwhelmed with debt that you can't breathe. And the next thing you know, you can't come to church because you don't get just get to work the overtime anymore. You have to work the overtime. Another thing is I have to be transparent about my own level of temptation. I don't want anything hidden. I don't want to start compromising on my inward convictions. and I don't want to live alone like the Lone Ranger so that nobody has the authority to call me in. As I work toward a close here, I want to close with this. I have to monitor my obsession with anything. I have to monitor my obsession with anything. I grew up in a home where um, hobbies were considered to be ludicrous. Uh, my dad worked all the time. We were poor people, but we didn't have a problem with work ethic, certainly not him. He, he worked night and day, and that's just what he did. Time to time, I'd ask him about things. Hey, Dad, what do you think about golf? Huh, that's stupid. <laughs> Waste your money on that. It's dumb. All right. What do you think about hunting, Dad? Well, my Lord, why are you going to chase an animal around? It's cheaper to go buy it from the grocery store. All right. What do you think about fishing, Daddy? That's an absolute waste of your time. You're going to take a day off of work, sit in a boat, and sweat. And you're probably not catching anything anyway. He was an optimist, but sometimes he could get so negative. You don't catch nothing anyway. Just go buy it. Besides, we work around here. That's what he would say. So, as a result, I grew up um, with, with somewhat of the same philosophy. I, I grew up when I, when I got in the church. I kind of sold myself to the church as a boy. Uh, that's just what I did, church, 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 more church. Anything with church was good. Anything that didn't involve church and work was bad. That's the kind of way I was raised. It worked out okay. Because, as I stand before you this morning, I have to say this. It's going to get really quiet in here, and I'm going to have to really encourage you to come to the altar in just a minute. We are being overtaken by our hobbies and our habits. Our hobbies are killing us. It's not just that you hunt and fish a little. Go ahead and do that. It's that you've sold your children's souls, your grandchildren's souls, every hobby known to man. We have no off seasons. We have no breaks. Football leads to basketball, basketball leads to baseball, baseball leads to soccer, however it happens. Soccer leads to rollerblading, rollerblading leads to hockey. We're just going nuts. As, as a result, our children have high hobby IQ, 
and low spiritual drive. We've become an obsessed culture. We let our habits control us. And our quirkiness controls us. And I've lived some of this, so I'm qualified to say it. It's a weird day in the church world when the coach's word trumps spiritual leaders. All you guests, please forgive me. I don't do this but once every now and then. Material things can eat away all my time, suck up all my resources, and use up all my influence. And from my perspective, many of us are wasting our influence being soccer moms and baseball dads. What at one time we used most of that influence to win souls. Apostle Paul said it like this in Acts 20. And I'm really closing this time. I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, only that I may finish my course. I remember my dad drilling me from time to time. Losing his mind at my sisters. One of my sisters blew a head gasket on a car once. My dad was giving her a royal chewing. And I remember him saying, Did you smell anything? Did you hear anything? Did you see anything? I tell you what my sister was doing. She had the radio up real loud. She had her foot in the pedal. She wasn't listening, looking, or hearing nothing. And I remember my dad said, if you'd have just checked it, baby. He was a little easier on the girls than he was the boys. If you just checked it, we could have avoided all this mess. And I look at my own life and yours as well. And I say to myself from time to time, Glenn, if you had just monitored the dashboard of your spiritual life, you'd have been a lot further down the road. So here's the deal. You don't quit God overnight. You don't get carnal overnight. You don't, to use a religious term, backslide overnight. Usually, we just stop doing the maintenance. And slowly, it takes its toll. Won't you stand with me? Hallelujah. <coughs> Thank you, Holy God. Here's what I'm saying. There's a meal prepared for those of you that have a, are involved with baby dedication. It's in building E. It'll be ready for you in a moment. But here, here's what I'm asking you. When's the last time you just stopped and checked yourself? If you do that, you're usually avoiding catastrophe. Check your hobbies. Check your habits. Check your time. Check the internal indicators. And just see. The church isn't exciting to you anymore, and if it doesn't mean much to you to pray, and if worship is kind of dull to you now, I predict you're just on the edge. 
spiritual meltdown. And today would be a good day to fix it. Today, just get it right. That's all. Now here's the deal. We've had an evangelist for a while. But you didn't got accustomed to him telling you when to come pray. That's fine. That's the way he works. And he's worked well. He'll be here back here tonight telling you what to do. But that's not the way we do it here. When we get to the end, we just kind of come forward without being asked if you need to pray. And so if you need to just check up on things, I think it'd be a good time just to check it out. Things are passing away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we Cross. 